Okay, uh, so in today's class, uh, let us discuss the application of this path integral formalism. So, if you recall uh, in the last class, I had stopped here where I showed uh, that you can find the quantum mechanical overlap between uh, of any operator. So, suppose you want to find the matrix element of some operator called Q between some two states initial and final and the final state is obtained by just uh, time evolving the initial state from the initial time to the final time. So, usually that type of uh, answer to that type of a question in uh, traditional quantum mechanics is uh, obtained by first solving Schrodinger's equation that is the time uh, dependent Schrodinger equation to obtain first the final state from the initial state. Uh, and then uh, just finding the, this overlap between the initial state and the operator Q acting on the final state. So, uh, that is typically how it is done in traditional approaches. But in uh, the path integral approach which uses the Lagrangian instead of the Hamiltonian, it just means that you find an answer to this type of question that is you, f you integrate over all paths. Okay, starting from uh, R 0 up to R n. So, your initial uh, point. So, that means you find all paths connecting uh, a point called R 0. Okay, so, you find uh, uh, so, there are two points R 0, R n which of course, will also be integrated over finally, but uh, to begin with you find uh, T. So, that means you, uh, you find the integral of this quantity which is e raised to i by h bar into action. So, you uh, add up all the, uh, so this is depends on the path. Okay. So, that means you add up over all paths. So, this is called the path integral and the path starts from, uh, so that means at the initial time the particle it is at R 0, final time it is at R n and all the uh, paths start and end at the same point. So, what you do is you first is find this quantity e raise to i by h bar into action for a given path, then you repeat it for uh, a second path and so on and so forth and basically you uh, add up all the paths, but then there are uncountable infinity of paths. So, you have to do a path integral. So, that is what this is that what I have circled here. Uh, yeah, I could have used a different color, but it is. Uh, so, but you know what I am talking about. So, this is that path integral. So, I have to integrate over all paths. So, now the answer after integrating over all paths, the final answer to that uh, will be a function of R 0 and R n. So, now you multiply by the overlap between R n and the initial state which is given in the problem and then you also find uh, overlap between uh, uh, the initial state and this uh, operator whose matrix elements you want to find acting on R 0. Okay. So, R 0 and R n are your in initial and end point of the path integral. So, that means you, even though you have summed over all paths, the final answer still depends on the starting point and ending point. So, R 0 is starting point, R n is ending point. So, now after integrating or all path you get a quantity which depends on R 0 and R n multiply that with this matrix element R n i then multiply with the overlap between the initial state and Q acting on R 0 and then after that you integrate over all R 0 and all R n because the final answer clearly does not depend. I mean R 0 and R n are you introduce we introduce in between for our convenience. The left hand side uh, it just depends on the initial state, final state. Uh, so, final state depends on the initial time, final time and the Hamiltonian of the problem and Q is a given operator. So, basically, uh, so, so if you integrate over R 0 and R n after doing the multiplying the, the first one, second one, third one, you are uh, integrate over R 0, R n. You finally get the answer to this question. So, in other words, you do not have to necessarily, so that means there is no uh, place where you are required to solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation and so on and so forth, but that is what you would have done if you had 
uh, wanted to evaluate this matrix element from using traditional quantum mechanics, the left hand side. Okay, so, so that is how you would go about doing, so I mean the answer to this question is a very general one, is not it? So that means most of the interesting questions in quantum mechanics can be posed as finding the uh, you know matrix element of some operator between some initial and final state. So, most of the interesting questions are of that nature anyway. So, what we have successfully do done is that we have recast the answer to that uh, uh, rather generic and general question that occurs uh, uh, repeatedly in traditional quantum mechanics. We have recast that in terms of a path integral. So, we have uh, explained how to evaluate the I mean or compute the answer to that question using Lagrangians instead of Hamiltonians. Okay, so now let me uh, go ahead and try to apply this to some particular problem. So, this was very general, it was formalism. So, specifically what I am going to do is I am going to find what is called the propagator. So, that means what I am interested in finding is basically imagine that the initial state is uh, a state uh, with well defined position of the particle. That means, the in the initial state the particle has a well defined position called R 0 and in the final state the particle has a well defined position R n. Okay. So, now I want to know the uh, what is the overlap between these two states. So, the initial state will be at time t i and final state will be at time. So, in other words uh, basically I want to know this itself whatever I am circling now. So, I really want that, that itself. So, in other words I want to know the path integral. So, that path integral clearly has the interpretation of an overlap between an eigenstate of position at time t i and eigenstate of position at time t f. Okay. So, it is like this. So, if at time t i you make a measurement of the position and the answer for that measurement comes out as r 0 then you wait for a time t f minus t i and then again you make a measurement of the position. The answer uh, comes out as r n t f. So, the question is what is the probability uh, or what is the overlap between these two states? That means, what is the probability that if the particle is at r 0 at t i, the particle will end up at r n at t f. So, the answer to that question is this path integral. So, now uh, if it is a free particle, so this is always true that that is always the answer to the question. But now if the particle is a free particle, then the Lagrangian is just the kinetic energy. So, now the kinetic energy is clearly half m r dot squared. So, now what I am going to do is as usual I am going to split up this uh, problem into two pieces. So, I have to do a path integral. So, that means I have to do a path integral initial position is R 0 and R n. So, instead what I want to do as I have been doing earlier also, I want to split this up in this path integral that means sum over all paths into a path which is basically the extremum or the most probable path, the one which extremizes the action. And then I want to say that uh, the actual path is uh, obtained by this extremum path plus a deviation. So, so this is extremum path is clearly the classical path. So, the path which extremizes the action is basically obeys the Euler Lagrange equations. So, that is the classical path. So, now I am going to write a general path okay, which, which is required in quantum mechanics. So, that means the uh, quantum particle does not necessarily always take the classical path. So, it, it takes all possible paths. And uh, so, I can always write the uh, a general path as the classical pl path plus some deviation uh, with respect to the classical path. So, q s is my uh, deviation. So, if I want to do a path integral, uh, I have to integrate over the deviation. So, the classical path is given, but the deviation is the one which is getting summed over because the original path has to be summed over. The classical path is a fixed uh, unique path. So, there is nothing to sum over there. So, the path that is getting summed over is R, therefore, it is also uh, means you are also required to sum over the deviation. 
So now clearly for a free particle the classical path is a straight line and the straight line uh, such that at uh, t equals t i the position is r 0 and at t equals t f the position is uh, so that means s is my I have parameterized in terms of s instead of t, t for some reason. So, uh, so basically uh, at s equals t i it is r 0 and as at s equals t f it is r n. So, that that is obeyed and this is a straight line. So, it is linear in s. Okay. So, now because uh, R, R and R C that is the classical uh, trajectory and the uh, uh, actual uh, path taken in uh, by the quantum particle both have the same end points. Clearly Q has to have this property its end points has to be 0 because uh, R and R C have the same end points. So, now the point is I mean so when you uh, actually uh, recast all the original path integral in terms of Q instead of this what you end up getting is basically the cross term cancels out and you get this term. So, you will get a classical uh, term times this. So, now uh, you know I told you the reason why we do this is because you see once you make the deviations the end point of the deviation both are 0 that immediately means I have periodicity. So, that means at q at t i is 0 and q at t f is also 0. So, that means I can exploit periodicity and write uh, decompose q in terms of a discrete Fourier series rather than uh, some general transform which would not be useful. So, so this is what I have done. So, you see here q uh, bracket s has the property that when s is t i it is 0, when s is t f it is also 0 that is why it is sin pi n. Okay. So, it is a discrete Fourier series. So, once I do this I can go ahead and uh, rewrite the action in terms of the deviation uh, in terms of the discrete components q n. Okay. So, now what I am going to do is that uh, what we have to do is we have to integrate over all the q n's, but we also know that if uh, see, but we would not be able to fully understand how to fix those proportionality. So, basically this is the once you integrate over all the q n's it has the nature of a proportionality constant, but rather than fixing it that way I mean rather than struggling with uh, that type of a calculation. What we do is we make use of this clever observation and that is that if T f is equal to T i right. So, if you have a free particle and you do not wait at all that means you start at T i you are supposed to wait until you uh, the time becomes T f before finding the overlap. Suppose you do not wait that means your starting time is T i ending time is also T i. So, now what do you expect the overlap to be clearly it will be 0 unless the end end value of r is same as the beginning value of r. So, unless r n equals r 0 the overlap is 0 because the particle has not had time to move right initially it was at uh, r 0 at time T i but then uh, T f is equal to T i that means you do not give it enough time to move. So, clearly its position should still always remain uh, R 0 only quantum mechanically as well as classically. So, it there is no time for the wave function to spread or uh, for the particle to move or whatever it is. So, clearly uh, this is valid. So, that means the quantum mechanical overlap is 0 unless in which case it is a Dirac delta function. Okay. So, what you do is that basically uh, rather than struggling with integrating over all these q n's which is what it would be what you do is you multiply with this clearly we know that uh, th this integral this particular uh, this one this is just a function of uh, T f and T i. So, uh, so specifically it will be a function of T f minus T i because it is a free particle. So, it is some function of T f minus T i and instead of struggling uh, by acting actually doing that integral which is what you would have to do. You, what we do is we write this uh, overlap as uh, what we got earlier. Uh, so, just remember where this came from. This simply came from just substituting uh, uh, this uh, this kind of a uh, this kind of a relation with this into the original action and uh, you end up with uh, this uh, this one. 
that means you end up with half m v, v c squared and v c squared was basically equal to this one ok. So, so that is v c square half m v c squared into T f minus T i. So, that is basically R n minus R 0 squared divided by T f minus T i squared into T f minus T i. It is half m v squared into T f minus T i, but then so one of the T f minus T i from the denominator cancels out. So, you get this. So, that is where that came from ok. So, the rest of the thing is just the integral over deviations. So, the bottom line is instead of trying to struggle and find the actual answer by integrating over all the q n's, I do a shortcut. I, I, I realize that when T f equals T i, it is a Dirac delta. So, I uh, just give it a name. I just call it uh, T f g of T f minus T i. And uh, so, this is clearly the most general answer to the overlap. So, then uh, what I do is that I, I make use of this, uh, the, this is obtained by integrate, I mean you, this is the general observation, then you simply integrate over all the Rn's and then take the limit you get 1 because that is how it is. So, what we do is that uh, here you simply integrate over all the Rn's because uh, right. So, and, uh, and you make T f tends to T i, it should give you 1. So, that is going to happen. So, the after you integrating over all R n this this is what it is and this should be 1 uh, when T f tends to T i. So, that is going to happen very easily if you choose this. So, now if once you choose this then it clearly has that uh, property that uh, as uh, T f tends to T i this whole thing will become a Dirac delta function ok. So, um, so that is what that is. Yeah, so, intuitively also you can see that this is the case. So, suppose uh, T f is not not equal to, uh, so rather R n is not equal to R 0, but T f tends to T i ok. So, if, uh, if T f tends to T i, what is going to happen is that this will oscillate. So, you see uh, T f tends to T i, so it will, uh, it will have a large uh, phase. So, it will basically oscillate and uh, average out to 0. So, basically if you plot this it will look like this. Uh, so, it, it will actually look like this. So, on an average it will average out to 0 ok. So, however, if R n is equal to R 0 then this will become 1 and then if you first make R, R n equal to R 0 and then take T f tends to T i you will get infinity because that is what you are supposed to do ok. So, if, if you first take uh, R n equals R 0 and then make T f tends to T i you get infinity because that is what. So, if R n equals R 0 to begin with you are supposed to get infinity because of the delta function. But uh, in general when R n is not equal to R 0 and you make T f tends to T i is supposed to get 0 because uh, when T f tends to T i uh, R n not equal to R 0 means the chances of that are 0. So, that means the overlap is 0. So, that is what we are finding here. So, intuitively that is uh, correct, but mathematically also it is correct because if you in, so it is therefore proportional to the delta function and the proportionality is 1 because if you integrate over R n you get 1 ok. Ok. So, now uh, so, the next uh, problem, uh, so this was uh, uh, free particles in the sense that it is absolutely free, uh, nothing is blocking anything. So, it is there are no potential energies and uh, the particle can have any momentum it wants, any energy it wants and so on and so forth. So, that is what a free particle is. But uh, in the next uh, example is uh, I have uh, concocted this example which is not found in many books but uh, it is also uh, something you should not take too literally. So, the example is the following. So, basically it uh, I am trying to uh, mimic the properties of uh, electron in a metal which has energy close to the Fermi energy. So, that means I am trying to mimic the behavior of an electron in a metal whose energy is close to the Fermi energy. So, of course, uh, I must, I mean all these uh, words will make sense if you have some background in solid state physics or STATMEC. So, that is one of the, STATMEC is a prerequisite for this course. So, that is the reason why I made that sentence. 
So, basically in a metal what happens is that uh, uh, you have a large number of electrons uh, and they are all fermions they obey Pauli exclusion principle. So, now uh, if you try to uh, make the electron occupy uh, one energy level, so you, you can at most occupy one more electron with that energy and after that you will have exhausted all the possible state I mean you, you can't uh, accommodate more than two because one has to have up spin the other is down spin. So then you have to go to the next level, next level, next level like that. So if you have large number of electrons like you have conduction electrons in a metal, so the ground state itself will have a huge energy. Okay, so that uh, huge energy is uh, the called the Fermi energy. So it will be uh, fully populated up to some energy. So now you know an electron with uh, energy close to the Fermi energy cannot uh, scatter to any state whose energy is less than the Fermi energy because all states below Fermi energy are occupied. So, so what I am going to say is that I am going to make this, uh, uh, so I am firstly I am going to focus in one dimension because uh, that is uh, of application interest also later on when we study Luttinger liquids and secondly also because it, uh, it just serves to illustrate the main point uh, without uh, getting bogged down in integrals, I mean one dimensional integrals are easy to do. So, the bottom line is that normally you know if I use invoke completeness uh, what I would do is I would write like this. So, this would be my completeness, uh, but then uh, in this case what I, I do is uh, that uh, you see, so that means normally a particle with a well defined position will make sense for a free particle means like if you have it makes sense to talk of a particle with a well defined position. But in this example uh, because the particle that I am looking at, so there is a uh, imagine there is a fermion and it is trying to wander around, but then it is constantly aware that it is in the presence of a filled Fermi C. That means uh, it is in the presence of a C of fermions which is uh, filled up to some Fermi momentum EF and which is determined by PF, PF squared by 2 m is EF. Okay. So, there is the for Fermi momentum and it is related to Fermi energy like this. So, that means there is a C of electrons we filled up to Fermi energy. So, another electron comes wandering around and it is uh, completely aware that uh, it is uh, in the presence of this Fermi C because it has to obey Pauli principle that means it cannot uh, go and sit on top of some other electron which is uh, having energy less than Fermi energy. So, it is fully aware that it has, so, so what will happen is that it will then what this means is that it is impossible to uh, uh, create an eigenstate of an electron with a uh, well defined position. So, remember what that means. See, if a particle has a well defined position, its momentum can be absolutely anything, right. If the position is strictly well defined, right. So, that means the spread in delta x is 0. So, that means Heisenberg principle is delta p is actually infinity, right, because it can be anything. So, momentum can be absolutely anything. But then if there is a field for me see its momentum cannot be absolutely anything, it certainly cannot be less than the Fermi momentum because those states are occupied by other electrons. So, what happens therefore is that uh, this type of an interpretation forces us to conclude that it is not possible to create an electron in the presence of a field Fermi C to have a uh, strictly uh, well defined position because a strictly well defined position implies uh, completely arbitrary momentum but that uh, violates Pauli principle with respect to the other electrons. So, the best you can do is actually write this. So, this is the closest you can come to creating a particle with some well defined position. So, what you do is you find this overlap which is basically e raised to i x i p x by h bar and you multiply by eigenstate of position and you sum over all p such that uh, its magnitude is greater than p f so that uh, you are staying away from filled states. So, p greater than p f are all empty states. 
so you are staying staying away from a field states so and yet you are trying to mimic the idea that you are uh, trying to find a particle with some position x so this is the closest you will come to finding a uh, particle with some position x okay so what will happen is that finally when you try to evaluate this you get this answer so if you try to find the overlap between this and a strictly eigen state of position so it basically tells you that it will actually not be a delta function as it would be if it were genuinely i mean if if there was no poly principle involved so rather uh, it will because there is a poly principle involved there is a spread so that means that the a particle with well defined position in the presence of field fermi c is not possible but it is possible approximately in the sense that you will get a, a distribution which is peaked at that uh, at that position that you are looking for okay so i'm i don't want to make a big fuss about it but i i just thought i'll let you know so uh, so now re the real question is the following so this is the propagator so this is called the propagator so this is what we got by uh, just doing normal quantum mechanics there's no path integrals here right so this is conventional quantum mechanics so now my question is the following so the why did i bring this up because this chapter is about path integrals so the thing is that i want to be able to see if i can get this answer by a suitable path integral so what i'm going what i've done here is that to do this i have postulated the following so imagine that the hamiltonian so that means sir, now i have to re re reinterpret my problem in such a way that it captures the presence of this uh, fermi c of electrons okay which is uh, providing this poly principle poly exclusion principle effect which will prevent the an electron that's wandering around in the metal to have uh, any momentum less than the fermi momentum okay so the way this is done is that you say that the hamiltonian of that wandering electron is p squared by 2m except when uh, p squared by 2m only when p is greater than pf that means magnitude of p is greater than pf but when magnitude of uh, p is less than pf the hamiltonian is basically infinity in the sense that so we we say it is infinity Uh, to ensure that uh, an electron can never be uh, have that momentum because it's basically ener energetically unfavorable for the electron so i'm i'm forcing poly exclusion principle by making it uh, energetically very unfavorable for the electron to have that energy um, less than the fermi energy so that means i am making it impossible for the electron to have energy less than the fermi energy by just introducing this cut off function cp so what i am saying is that if energy is uh, less than fermi energy uh, the hamiltonian blows up so so it is energetically overwhelmingly um, unfavorable for the electron to have that energy okay so now if you accept that point of view then it's easy to find the overlap Uh, so firstly you can find the overlap using conventional uh, approaches so that means this is this is your overlap this is the definition of the overlap this is the uh, evolution unitary evolution and then you just go ahead and uh, do this uh, so you just have to evaluate this integral so then you split this up into right more so p equals pf plus plus pf plus p dash and p equals minus pf plus p dash so you can split this up into two parts and then you can go ahead and evaluate this okay so you can actually get these so what are called right movers and left movers by doing this okay so you will see that uh, finally the answer is of this type so this is called the left mover this is called the right mover so that's because the pole of this function is when delta x is equal to plus vf delta t okay so that's called the right mover so the because the velocity is positive and it is negative in this case so that's why it's called the left mover so the answer to this overlap is basically the sum of right and left moving green's functions so now the question is how would i reinterpret this in terms of path integrals so as usual what i do is i invoke this trotter product formula 
by dividing by n and uh, making n copies. So, if I divide by n I get T f by minus T i by n is epsilon. So, I have introduced an epsilon then I make n copies of that. So, as usual when I make n copies I can insert a complete set of states with position x i in between and then I end up calculating this ok. So, so and here I do not have to use any trotter product because actually there is no um, potential energy. So, it is I can just directly evaluate this ok. So, I just directly evaluate this and I get this sort of thing ok. So, uh, I basically end up getting this this type of so the overlap between successive uh, points. So, that means, the, so remember I am just going quickly because I have done this earlier. So, you, so the thing is the idea is that you split up uh, some path uh, between initial and final points into pieces and these are called x k x k plus 1 like that and then you find this overlap and then you rewrite this in terms of this integral like this. So, then you will end up with uh, getting this Lagrangian. So, this is uh, so this is what you would have got if there was no poly principle. So, this is if there was no poly principle the path integral would have simply this because it is just action right it is half mv squared because Hamiltonian kind uh, Lagrangian are the same for free particle. So, it is just uh, e raised to i by h h bar into integral l d t because d t is that epsilon. So, l is half m v squared. So, it is uh, uh, x k minus uh, uh, x k plus 1 minus x k divided by epsilon whole squared is your uh, x dot squared. So, that gets multiplied by d t which is epsilon. So, you get this epsilon here ok. So, that is what that was. So, bottom line is that you would have uh, got this, but then the new ingredient is this one ok. So, this uh, this is the new ingredient. So, this is there because of poly principle. So, bottom line is that uh, so, if you follow this logic what you will do is you will end up uh, getting this type of a path integral. So, this is the path integral. So, this is x dot squared ok. I should have written x dot squared. So, uh, if there was no poly exclusion principle that means, if there was a free particle running around in one dimension and there was nothing else uh, the answer for the propagator that means, the what is the probability if the particle was at uh, you know x i at t i what is the probability uh, or the what is the probability amplitude that the particle will be at x f at t f is simply given by this path integral that is if if that particle was minding its own business there was no metal no poly exclusion principle and thing this is would be the answer is this path integral. So, just start at x i at t i and end at x f at t f which we have already evaluated, but now if there is uh, some something which is preventing it from moving freely like there is a field Fermi C of electrons and this electron that is wandering around has to be very conscious of the presence of this field Fermi C. It has to make sure that its energy will never fall below the Fermi energy. So, then uh, the path integral will have to be modified in this way. So, you will have to introduce some additional terms like this ok. So, this additional terms will be very complicated. So, it is basically the non it is non local type of. So, bottom line is that the, you might be wondering why did I give such a horrendous example. So, the reason is basically I just wanted to point out that uh, in general if you introduce fermions in the problem uh, there will always be some difficulties like this. So, this is a simple example where uh, I showed you that introducing fermions will actually create problems in the sense that uh, the path integrals will become very unusual. So, in fact, later on we will see in the context of uh, what are called coherent state path integrals, the you will be integrating over some very funny kind of uh, versions of complex numbers called Grassmann numbers, Grassmann variables. So, those are anti commuting complex numbers. So, those type of concepts will occur when you are dealing with fermions. 
So this is a first example I have introduced where introduction of fermions obeying Pauli exclusion principle even though the situation appears to be rather simple namely one dimension one fermion trying to wander around from xi at ti to xf at tf but then it is constantly being reminded that it is in the presence of this filled Fermi C of electrons up to Fermi energy. So it has to constantly obey the Pauli exclusion principle as it moves from xi at ti to xf at tf. So the path integral will become extremely complicated because of that. So bottom line I am trying to say that uh, once you try to study fermions uh, basically things are very complicated and this is the first example where I have explicitly displayed that complication. So later on we will find uh, other examples where fermions will present its own unique set of complications. But uh, we have uh, this is uh, almost intractable. But uh, in other examples in especially in coherent state path integrals you will see that it is still tractable, we can handle it. Okay. So uh, here for example I have tried to evaluate uh, that um, path integral by doing a bunch of things and I am getting back the answer that I got by traditional method. So I do not want to bore you with this but it is possible to struggle and evaluate this path integral. Uh, by kind of doing something clever, saddle point or whatever it is, then you can actually get back the original answer you got from more traditional methods. So I do not want to bore you with the details but bottom line is that uh, it is possible to do this uh, if you wish. But uh, the ma main message is that if you are dealing with fermions be prepared to suffer some complications especially non-local type of ideas will be quite common. Okay, uh, so now the second more familiar example is that of a harmonic oscillator. So um, harmonic oscillator uh, as usual, uh, so say, same question what, what is the overlap between if the particle is at xi at ti. What, uh, what is the amplitude that you will it will end up at xf at tf. So the answer is clearly same thing uh, this path integral e raised to i by h bar into action but then keep in mind the action will have two things one is the kinetic energy the other is potential energy. So as usual you will we will be doing the saddle I mean we will be finding the extremum the classical action and then we will expand around that and all that. So I think I do not want to rush it so I am going to stop here and in the next class I will continue with the harmonic oscillator okay, because I want to spend some time properly explaining it. It is pretty much very analogous to the free particle it is just that I want to do it uh, a little bit systematically. Okay. So once we are done with that we will move to some other topic because this will give you enough practice in handling path integrals. Okay. So thanks for listening, hope to see you in the next class, thank you.